Hi, this is Dr. Scott Young, and today we're going to do the Tribulation series. This is part five, and it's going to be the two witnesses. So you're going to have a lot of fun going over this, but we're going to show you the non-linear nature of Revelation and how to be able to like unlock the keys. Coming right up. Okay, so let me flip over, pull my glasses on, put, flip over into the uh, uh, PowerPoint here. So <clears throat> try to keep some of this consistency here with this, this the world is burning. And, and because no one has ever experienced a time. You think, I, I know some truthers believe that we are in the tribulation and there is no way we're in the tribulation. If you've been even through a portion of the series, you already realize that. I mean, there's just no possible way for that to actually happen. So let's talk a little bit more about that and we'll kind of show you. There is a nonlinear nature to the time every time John moves up into heaven. Now let's, let's, let's back up here for half a second, okay? So for, in, for, for the first thing you have to see is John is in Revelation 1 through four, uh, 3, basically. He is living in 95 AD. He talks in past tense, or excuse me, he's, he talks in a future tense. Sorry, I said that wrong. He talks in a future tense when he's giving communication. So he's talking about the churches, and, and that's how you normally should talk <coughs> when you're in that particular viewpoint, because he's talking in, in just a unique way. Then he, in, in Revelation 4, verse 1, he's come up here. There's a door that's open. He comes up here. He is transported, and that would actually be a type of, of rapture event, or harpezo. Rapture is Latin, harpezo is in Greek. Caught up here, event. So it's a it's a, it's an it's a reference. It's an inference of that idea. And then from that point on, from Revelation uh, four to Revelation um, nineteen. Now we focus mostly on this whole series, Revelation uh, six to Revelation nineteen. I mean, we, I'll flip over a couple other verses, but pretty much we're staying in those, the, the lane. And, but when Revelation 4 through 5 and on, he goes in a really unique way. He talks in a future tense. He is in our future. We're in 2024, early January 2024. He is talking about our future because it hasn't happened yet. And he's talking about it in his past tense. That's actually how you write it. Now, I have a book here called Foretold. It's a foretold series, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. But it's a fiction series that I have. And I'll talk about this at the very end. But when you write fiction, um, you have to write it as past tense. Because in the reader standpoint, when, she, when she's sitting there reading the book, she sees it in past tense because... It's already happened as she's picked up the book. It's just a, a trick of, of the way that you write things. And yet, John is doing that same kind of conversation. Again, John's not writing fiction. He's writing it as if it's happened. So when you read it, it's already happened. So in essence, our future has already occurred. That should blow your mind. Now, Let's talk a little bit about some of that. That's the cool part I always want to share with you. Um, sometimes it feels when we go through this, this part, it gets so confusing. And, it, and, and, and John even says that it takes wisdom to understand. Um, you know, if, if you have ears to hear, let him hear. You know, or let the churches listen. And, and he's like talking through this kind of stuff. And you're like, huh? And... I'm going to tell you the truth. Um, there's family members of mine that will say to me, have said to me in the past, 
I'll read, we read from Genesis all the way up to Jude. We stop at Revelation because it's too hard and we go right back to Genesis. And I'm like, dude, I mean, you're missing the best book. Not necessarily, but you get the idea. Um, and it's just like, you're missing out on this amazing kind of book because Revelation 1, 3 says there's a blessing that happens in there. And again, we've talked about that. But there's so many things that are that are confusing people when they read it. It's very difficult. And it's this is one of those areas that gets confusing. Because in this whole chapter, John actually breaks the linearity, linearity mode. And let's explain that. The whole chapter of chapter 11, because this is what where we are, the two witnesses. Chapter 11 talks about the rise, the death, and the resurrection of these two guys. And we'll talk about who they are in here in a minute. But that's what messes you up. So it goes backward in time. And let me explain a little bit more. So each time John places the emphasis in heaven, it's one of the clues that something has changed. So when we're in Revelation 6 verse 9, we have the fifth seal. Now, if you've been watching the series, I've talked to you about the seals go from the beginning of the tribulation all the way through the very ending, the very buttressed end of the tribulation. Oh, wait, hey, so I use that word, but you get the idea, the butt end. Um, the total end of this. The trumpets start in the middle of the tribulation. They go concurrently along with the seals. Now, when we jump in to this part, so we have the fifth seal is actually in the second half of the tribulation. And so when John skips a step here, he jumps up, he time shifts because chapter 11 is, is messing with this thing. And he starts off with this kind of wording. He goes, then I was giving a, given a measuring rod like I mean, a measuring reed like a rod, so like a yardstick, okay, in essence. And I was going with these words, go measure the sanctuary and the altar and count those who worship there. And you're like, okay, so that's got to be something related to the Jews, right? It's Jewish in origin. That should tell you. And when I see people who call themselves witnesses, I go, you are not the witness. Now, I do know a couple, and probably some of you guys know a few um, truthers who call themselves Moses, Moses and Elijah. And we'll talk about those two people. And, and I'm going, you are not Moses and Elijah. You are not Jewish, number one. And number two, they only show up for 1,260 days. So if your life can be measured in three and a half years, you're not one of the witnesses. Sorry, it's what the word says. Okay? So that measuring stick is also saying that three and a half years or the 1260 days. Okay, so let's give a clue about which time frame. Because one of the hard parts about trying to figure out where they would place, you'd place them in, is you put them in the front part of the tribulation or the first half of the tribulation or the second half, okay? Now, the Left Behind series has, um, and we will talk more about this, the Left Behind series, again, great fiction, great, great work in a lot of ways, but the Left Behind series puts the two witnesses along with the 144,000 witnesses concurrent to one another. The two witnesses die in the middle of the tribulation-ish, and a uh, time frame-ish time frame. And, and I'm like, no, it doesn't make any sense. Why do you have both of them there at the same time frame? Because when we look at this, they come in in verse three, four, and five. I will empower my two witnesses. They will prophesy for 12 and a, uh, 12, 1260 days, dressed in sackcloth. There are two olive trees, two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And so when he's saying that, he's going, wait a second. There are lampstands and olive trees. That is absolutely Jewish in origin. 
They absolutely have to be Jewish. If anyone wants to harm them, fire comes out of their mouths and consumes the enemies. If anyone wants to harm them, they must be killed in this way. So these guys got some big old nasty powers. So if you think you're one of the witnesses, you don't have that kind of power. And I can tell you right now, you don't have that power. So don't call yourself a witness in that way. Okay. Secondly, they just have this supernatural power. And that supernatural power kind of intimates the concept that they have a judgment that isn't actually there um, in the same way that the two, that, that the 144 witnesses, 144,000 witnesses do. You see, I've always said this conversation. If you believe in a pre-tribulation, or excuse me, a post-tribulation rapture of the church, or uh, a, it's called a pre-wrath position. That means very near the end of the tribulation, uh, because we're not appointed for wrath, they will, these people will say, that's when we're, we're going to go through all the way through the tribulation, and then boom, we're out of here. Okay. And, or they'll say the rapture, is, I don't even, even believe in the rapture. Some people want to say the rapture isn't what you think it is. And, and they don't come up with real good answers for what they think it is because they really don't want to read the verses. Because if they read the verses, it tells of something of taken out of here. So there's a real interesting conversation. And it talks about encouraging one another to this. If you want to study that a little bit more, you go to my Hope in the Last Day series to get more information. So if you are God and you're saying, what's the job of the church? Well, the job of the church in this time frame is to preach. But if we have 144,000 and their job is to preach to the world, I'd say, well, what is going on with those uh, with the Christians? Why are they preaching when you got the 144,000 people doing? So why are they doing the same job? And people go, well, they got two different jobs. They're doing two different people. That's not what the scriptures say. They're preaching to all the nations. They will have an effect to all the nations, all the peoples, all the tongues. That's Revelation 7, verse 9. So these guys will talk to the whole, I mean, the 144,000 will talk to the whole group of people. Whereas the two witnesses have much more of a judgment message when you study those guys. So when do you see more of the major judgments that come out? the second half. And that's why it's more effective to put them there. So we'll see, and we'll show you more about that here as we go along. Okay. Two witnesses. Um, I believe Enoch and Elijah. Let me talk a little about some of the reasons for that, the case for those, and not Moses. Now, Enoch and Elijah never died. Let's, and, and if you don't know the stories, basically, you have Enoch, who lives uh, 365, I think it's 365 years, it could be 360 years, I'm blanking it out here. It's in Genesis. And in that time frame, so we got a dog bark in the background. So in that time frame, we have him living, he walks with the Lord, and then the Lord just says, ah, I'm going to take you on home. So he suddenly isn't there anymore. So Genesis just says he's there. He walked with God, he had a really good relationship, and boom, he's gone. Now we also have um, the book of Enoch that is actually referenced. It's an extra biblical book. Do not place it inside of the Bible. It is noted as an extra biblical book, but it is actually kind of referenced to in Jude. So it's a good book to look at, but it isn't the book that I want to live my life by whereas the other ones are. I mean, like Jude or John or First John or pick the other one that you want to talk about, okay? But it is instructive in some ways. So Enoch doesn't die. Secondly, and Enoch, by the way, talks a lot about end time issues. So that tells you that he's got some inkling of end time issues. Elijah also is a guy that talks a lot about judgment when you read about him in the Old Testament. In his books and, and in his all, all, all in his book and his 
referent points that come up. He's talking about judgment. And then he has, um, it, it, um, I'm blanking that one. Uh, Eli, or sorry, his, um, and, and he's got he's got his underling, forgive me, his underling that comes underneath him. And, and, and he goes, I would love to see you go through this. He goes, if you're the going to be there when I leave, you will get a double portion of, portion of blessing. Okay. And so he actually sees him and he gets the double portion of blessing. So he goes up in this chariot or the chariot of fire that you might have heard of. So Enoch and Elijah both never die. That's a really powerful point. Both of them called down judgment. And here's my big issue that I get a little sideways on when people want to say Moses is involved with it, is that Hebrews 9.27 says, it's appointed for man to live and die and go to judgment or their personal judgment, you know, um, their decision along with God. And, and here's the point. These guys at the end of their time frame are going to die at the 1260th day. So if you have Moses, he does die on Mount Sinai. That doesn't really make sense to have Moses die, then come back to life, and then become, and then die a second time. Now, some people will say to me, yeah, but he came, Moses and Elijah came down in the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. I get it. That's what I'm, I'm saying. This is the case for Elijah. This is what I'm real strong on that viewpoint. And I think a lot of people will go this kind of way. But again, am I going to die if it's Moses? No, I'm not going to die. Just chill out. I'm just telling you about the biblical case for it. Don't get too worried about overall details. But again, I'm trying to give you some of the reasons why I would say that. Okay. These two bring down huge amount of plagues upon the land. Now, interesting, some of the prophets, prophets limit their effect to Israel, but verse six, it says, these men have power to close up the sky so that no one, it cannot rain in those days of prophecy and, and that they will call down plagues. Now, Jeff Swanson, who actually is, is um, we're going to show you on our timeline. You're going to see this on our website, on, on his on theplanbible.com and mine on drscottyoung.com. It's not there yet because we're still working out some of the details on this thing. But we're going to have a tribulation uh, type of thing you can download for free. And it is a tribulation timeline. Right now you can do hope in the last days timeline. But we're going to have a second one that you can actually do. And one of the things that, that, that comes out here at his belief, Jeff and I talk a lot. And when we get into things, it gets really deep in scripture. And his basic, basic point, I think it's real interesting, is that um, um, Elijah and Enoch, these two witnesses, are actually going to call down the trumpets and the bowls. Very interesting. Now remember, the seals have to be done by Jesus because he is the one opening the seals. He has a job. The angels will blow the trumpets, but who might be calling the plague? Who might be saying the different things that are happening, in which if you've listened to the, you know, some of the things, and we'll talk about, we've talked a little bit about the trumpets, but those plagues are really interesting with that. So that's why it's it's a pretty interesting point here, okay? I believe that they actually could just be that, that instrument, instrument more specifically of trumpets. I think they could do some of the bowls, but I'm not sure if they do all the bowls because we'll talk about their death point in, the, in here in a minute. Okay, so they actually have a martyrdom event here. So now we need to understand martyrdom a little bit. Revelation 7, or 11 verse 7, when they finish their testimony. Now this is a really powerful word. The testimony means martia. It's the evidence that you give. But if it's the evidence that you would give in the court of law. Think about that for a second. 
in past time frames, in ancient time frames, if you gave a wrong piece of evidence in a court of law, you could be held not just in contempt of court and they put you in jail for a couple days or weeks or whatever, you would die for your testimony. That's why they called this martia. It was a report or tetanus. This was a witness testimony. That means that person's got to be there to see it and he better tell you the truth. So help me God kind of thing. Or he's going to die. So this is really important to get the truth out. Only the Antichrist has the capability to kill them. Because what it says, the beast, the Antichrist, comes up out of the abyss and makes war against them, will conquer them and kill them. Then it goes through in a real weird way. They lie on the streets for three and a half days. And you go, going, okay, why would they lie on the streets for three and a half days? So the corpse, corpses are bloating in there. This actually kind of made me think when you go to Revelation 11 verse 7, I mean 8 verse 8, it tells you it's it's a prophetical point of called Sodom and, uh, and, and it's called Sodom and Egypt. So he's, so John is going, remember Sodom. In Sodom and Gomorrah, you've got um, a time frame of immense evil. In Egypt, you also have a people who have e uh, evil, but judgment is called down. So it's giving you two separate viewpoints, not just Sodom and Gomorrah, but Sodom and the points of Egypt. And so they're, they're in the great city, which would be Jerusalem, where the, their Lord was crucified. So they are absolute believers in Christ. So these are Messianic Jews in many ways too. The representative, representatives of the people will give gifts throughout the world. Now, I, I got to tell you that when you first, when you read that, you, you will kind of think about giving gifts in different ways. Now, there's two basic time frames that most people give gifts. Number one is for birthdays. And that's kind of a holiday, uh, but it's a personal holiday. The number one that we think about, the pagan way that we have changed it in December 25th, which is not Jesus' real birthday. It's really, uh, it's re you want to hear a real interesting one? It's 9-11 of 3 BC. That's when Jesus was really born. 9-11. Is that an interesting date to some of you guys? It should be. What's 9-11 BC? 9-11-3 BC. Rosh Hashanah, the coronation of the king. We will talk about the coronation of the king on Rosh Hashanah. That's when actual, the actual Jesus' birth. Now, <clears throat> the, it's so strange to for the writers of of the New Testament, specifically John, and then these guys, these monks throughout the history that would put this little thing, this caveat of, it, it, would, it, it wouldn't make any sense because almost no time frame, I mean, 1500 years would go by before you would really ever celebrate Christmas in the way that it's done pretty much today. It's only been the last, you know, several hundred years that we celebrated Christmas by giving gifts to one another. So it's kind of an audacious statement in 1000 AD or 700 AD or 1200 AD when they read this and they're going, you know, that doesn't make sense. And if it doesn't make sense, why wouldn't the rewriters, many of you want to think the Bible is corrupted, why wouldn't the rewriters of the Gospels go, let me just fix that up for you guys. Let me rewrite that a little bit better so it can say it more logically. You see, rewriters, wouldn't they want to make it sound better? And yet, never, nary a one does it. That's the coolest point about this thing. So they give gifts to one another. 
after these guys get resurrected, now they get resurrected in front of them, the second woe begins, and it's called a local earthquake. And we'll show you more about this basic time frame. There's a local earthquake that occurs. In that local earthquake, a tenth of the city is destroyed, and about 7,000 people are dead. This is not the wrath of the Lamb earthquake. This is only in Jerusalem. Okay, so it's a very small earthquake overall. 7,000 people are dead. This is not the wrath of the Lamb earthquake. Okay, let's talk about this timeline because I want to show you how it kind of sets up here. Okay, so we first have, you know, we have the Ezekiel 38 and 39 war. And by the way, there is an earthquake in Ezekiel 38 and 39 in the eastern mountains of, of Israel. It stops cold all the advances of the armies of Gog and Magog. So that's one minor earthquake. Now, no one will pay attention to the earthquake because they will be focused on the other things that happen around it to kill off everyone of Gog, Gog's little uh, cadre, let's say, okay, the Magog groups, okay? But that is one earthquake. It's real interesting. That's one of the first earthquakes that they talk about. Now, then we have the pre-tribulation rapture of the bride, now, I use a very, very clear wording when I talk about this, because we're talking about the bride. Now, note here this, this one point, because you as the bride of Christ have a job. You're not a child of God. You're not going into heaven as the child, or at least you shouldn't be in essence. You are going into into heaven as the bride. And we talk so much about this in Revelation, or excuse me, in the Hope in the Last Day series that you really need to watch this if you want to get a clearer picture of this. But I'm going to give you the basic kind of thing. In that first section, we have a wedding ceremony in heaven. That's in Revelation 4 and 5. And you don't even realize that. They actually are giving gifts to one another. That is a Jewish tradition of wedding. There is a marriage ceremony with only the family around them. And by the way, it's referenced a little bit when you have Jesus sitting on the throne and there's the 24 elders from, I would say, from the Old Testament and the New Testament sitting around the throne. So they're sitting around the throne and that tells you that's a very small cadre group of people of, that are witnessing the wedding ceremony because that's telling you about a wedding ceremony. Because when they get their crowns on their head, those potential of a five crowns that they could get, and then they cast their crowns upon the throne, they go, man, I, I'm not worthy of these crowns. And if you study the crowns, boy, they're totally cool with this. But this whole thing actually is so beautiful because the wedding ceremony actually goes on for the first day or so, and the wedding type of feast will go on for seven days. Well, guess what? In heaven, we're going to be like, have it, we're going to have this go on for seven years as a inference point. In Daniel 9.27, it talks about a week time frame. Wedding time frame. That's, he would, he's using words that everyone in Scripture Everyone in that time frame, everyone in the Jewish time frame, if you said a week, you're saying, why are you using a reference of a wedding? In the middle of the wedding, he says that the, the basically the Antichrist goes into the temple and does an abomination kind of conversation. You're like, whoa, something different. So he's, he's even giving you the, the inference that, that Jewish people will get. Okay? Now... Let's go on and move on so you kind of see a little bit more. The 144,000 show up near the beginning of the tribulation. And people always say, well, my wife was even talking about this yesterday. Uh, she was like, why do you have the 144,000 showing up there? I mean, doesn't the, the, the tribulation start with the Antichrist? Well, yes, it does. But don't you think God's going to start up pretty quickly? He needs to get these people up and running 
quickly so that they can bring in what I would call the chosen. The chosen are actually um, listed, they're called the elect. Oh my gosh. And some people want to say, well, that's, that's, the, um, that's the Jews. No, it's not. It is not the Jews because it says this in Matthew 22, 1 through 13. It says, many are chosen, but, but excuse me, many are called, but few are chosen. To be chosen is one who is a guest, and that's actually what it says, a guest at the wedding. Think about that for a second. The whole definition of the word, ekletos, the chosen, is to be someone who is a guest at the wedding feast. That's his whole job. So he's got to go up and be in the wedding feast. That's why I believe there is a second rapture, of the, not of the church, but of the chosen. And the 144,000 suddenly disappear from the planet. It's a whole long conversation we could get into. Again, go into the Hope in the Last Day series. Some of you are going to go, yeah, I want to know about that. I know. You got to, got to go in the next series. Okay. The called will start showing up in that second half of the tribulation. It's they were invited to the wedding, Matthew 22, but they didn't want to come. They had other business that you, you read about. And it tells you, and it's going, it's because these people have a different, different path to them. These people will actually make up the martyrs. They come to, to understanding of this because of the two witnesses. Now, there's also an angel of the Lord that actually goes around. But the two witnesses are involved in bringing the called to the Lord, whereas the 144,000 Jews bring the chosen in. You see, I want you to think about, about this for a second. We sort of referenced this a little bit ago. <clears throat> Old Testament, the Jews are the preparers of the word, right? They're holding on to the word, and then they have this temple and all the stuff that, that goes along with that, right? So they're the the holders of God, in essence. And they're actually married to God. But they get a divorce from God. They keep getting a divorce from God. That's what actually the Old Testament says. They keep divorcing God because they really don't want to be with him. And many of the prophets will tell you about this, give you these inference points that they have a divorce from God. Now, when we get to the New Testament and we get to um, Jesus, he brings in 12 disciples who are all Jews. Then in, in Acts, uh, beginning of Acts, uh, Peter preaches and he has 4,000 people who come to the Lord. Those are Gentiles. Well, some of them probably were Jews too, but many were Gentiles because they were speaking with many different tongues all over the planet. So it was like, whoa, I mean, different languages. So from the church age, from <clears throat> this is 33 AD, when Jesus has already passed, I mean, Jesus has been killed and given up his body in essence. This is what, what we know about in this, and that's in, uh, in John 19. He's given up his body. He's given up his, his, his spirit. I've, I've commended my spirit, right? From that point in time in the, in the church age, the Gentiles have the capability of bringing people to the world. But as soon as the bride of Christ leaves, we have to have a new point. The whole point of the tribulation is to bring the Jews back into line with Jesus. Because that's what you're going to find. Because the remnant will sh show up. They will come to Jesus at this time frame of Rosh Hashanah. Now, we'll talk about that in another time frame. He's always going after the Jews. Now, the Jews will be the teachers, the 144,000. They bring in the chosen. Then they leave. Then the two witnesses bring in the called, the kaleo, 
They were invited to a wedding, but they didn't want to come. Why? Because the wedding feast is already going. But it doesn't mean that they didn't want to. They're not douloses. They're not slaves. And some of you are going, oh, you're going too fast. I know. But I'm trying to share with you a little bit more about this. Okay. The first seal shows up in the beginning of the tribulation. The mark is in the middle-ish, you know, time frame. Okay. And I'll, of course, we have just hell on earth in that second half of the tribulation. Some of these, some of these people I, I talk to a lot and they go, I think that we're in the tribulation right now. I'm going, you think we're in the tribulation? You're not ready for what I'm going to tell you about next week or the next episode, uh, the, the sixth, uh, sixth one of this series. The sixth one of the series, we're going to talk about the mark of the beast and the, and the zombie trumpet. You are going to like spit nails to realize how ugly it's going to get. The reality is the seven seals show up in that blue section right there, all the way from the beginning to the end. The seven trumpets start in the middle section-ish, and the seven bowls are in that last, depends on what time frame you might do. Rosh Hashanah is about 10 days before Yom Kippur. And um, now Jeff Swanson and I have a slight disagreement on that viewpoint. He's, he has some of the bowls showing up in the beginning of, of the of month of Elul, which is about 30 days before, which I'm, I'm cool with. Um, and then I, but I put more of the, uh, of the, the bowls in the middle of that 10 day time frame. Again, we're talking about a few days difference, so it's not going to be that big of a deal. I, I'm not really worried about it, but that's just giving you some of the basis of where you might put that stuff with them. And by the way, the two witnesses, they go the 1260 days and then whoosh, they're brought up out. That's that purple line right here. They're raised up a type of rapture, but they have died. So there's, they have a resurrection of it. And by the way, the rapture actually I had a guy that, that emailed me, uh, David Whitcomb. David, you're watching this. So, hey, dude, um, if you go read uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, it says that the dead in Christ, we who are here are certainly not going to proceed or go before the dead in Christ. So my mother-in-law, her name is Jane, Jane was an incredible woman of God. One of the most servant hearts I'd ever met in my life. There's no one who had a better servant heart than Jane. I'm just telling you, just no one like her, okay? And she passed away because of, of dementia issues, right? And uh, this is probably about six years ago. And so she is in up here preparing for the wedding ceremony. She will come down with Jesus in the clouds and then we will meet them in the air. That's what Revel, I mean, that's what First Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18 tells you. Encourage one another with these words. That, that's not a bad thing. That's a wonderful thing. Exactly, right? So the dead will actually come to a resurrection. Well, guess what? This is why you have a resurrection event that happens with the two witnesses. That's why I believe you still back to the point of Enoch and Elijah. They have to be people who didn't die. So again, we've done, you know, those two witnesses. This is a shorter one than the other one. So we're going to hit the, the fifth trumpet and we're going to talk about the mark of the beast because they are so powerful. I'm, I'm real excited about this, but I think that you should be excited to see how this actually works. And as you do this, I want you to have your Bible right here. I want you to read it. Go back as you've watched this, read this stuff because it's so cool. It should encourage you in many ways because God has got this time set up. Even though we're in January of 2024 and it's really tough for you. Nasara is coming. It's going to have a time of a gold back currency. There is going to be some good times where we're going to expand the bride of Christ. We're going to teach people about the bride of Christ. 
They're going, there's a huge amount of people that are going to come to Christ. You are going to be a part of that. And then we will have this tribulation thing. But the tribulation has 650 verses. It has to come true because the word will come true. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. It has to come true. Hope that helped you out. Thanks so much.